Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Yes, it is Andre Norman, your host. You know what I'm saying? Day one podcast with Securus Originals. You're know saying Academy of Hope. You know, we are in the building. And we have my sister here. You know what I'm saying? Now, you originally from Yonkers? Uh, I'm originally from White Plains, New York. White Plains. So she up the street. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the, the rich section. You know what I'm saying? She live up the street with the bougie people. Nah, so. Nah, so. so. All the way from New York City. Yes. White Plains. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Down to Atlanta. Yes. For the sole purpose of blessing the audience, man, with the grace and the love that you have. And for those who don't know, you want to tell them who you be? Okay. What's up? Hey, everyone. My name is Stephanie Reed. I'm from White Plains, Westchester, New York, originally. And I've been in Atlanta, Georgia now for about eight years. Eight years? Mm -hmm. Now, this podcast is for people who are locked up. Yes. You know what I'm saying? That's my passion. It's what I do. You know, I spent 14 years inside. And we did a whole series called Second Acts, where mm -hmm. we talk with folks who change their life around. Well, even people who just in jail, just people who are on their second act in life. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about, like, the day one, when you first go inside, when you first come home, mm -hmm. stuff like that. How does that really affect people? You know what I'm saying? So I ask, I'm going to ask a question I don't know the answer to. How much time did you do? Ha <laughs> ha. Zero. <laughs> okay. So they're like, well... You've done no time, <laughs> no so time. why would I bring you on if you've done no time? And Because the reason I brought you is we had a guy who came on a platform named Brent. Uh -huh. He runs a drug treatment center. And he gave from the perspective of somebody who runs the center. And they see people's day one all the time. Mm -hmm. And we've had countless people who've served time. And they shared their stories of what it was like for them day one and how they turned it around. People from Detroit people from Dallas, people from all over the country have come and shared their story. And I thought it was super important that we get your perspective on day one. And so what is your day one of incarceration if you've never done time? Well, basically, I think sometimes um, we do do time out here. And when I say that, I say that to say my son is in jail for murder, 17 to life. So my day one was getting that phone call, his first day in jail, which was really in hospital. So that was my day one, getting that phone call and hearing that my son took someone else's life. So day one, mm -hmm. your son's inside on, on homicide, and they gave him 17 to life. Yes. We've heard countless people sit in that chair. Mm -hmm. And say, hey, I got 20, I got 30, I got a natural. And it's from their perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm saying they gave me like 95 years. They just said, bang, 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 bang. Mm -hmm. And I know from my perspective, I've never asked my mother what it was like for her mm -hmm. when she heard me get sentenced. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you when that judge told your son 17 to life? Well, actually, it started out at 25 to life when we were in court. Um, the first day, and they kept asking him to, you know, take a lower bid and... Could, you know, he just take it, and after a while, next thing you know, about three days later, looking at going into a courtroom and having to face another family that your child took their daughter's life is something I don't think anybody would ever want to experience. I wouldn't want that on my worst enemy. Um, the feeling of, first, let me rewind, going back to getting the phone call. Just unbelievable. I'm at, I'm with Rough Riders. I'm at Myrtle Beach Biker Week. I'm driving back to New York from South Carolina and get the call. So I'm driving for hours, calling every jail, calling every hospital. So it's just unreal because you didn't get no information over the phone. I actually had to drive straight to the police station in the city that it happened in, in Mount Vernon. And that's when I found out that he was actually in a um, hospital um, in the Bronx. So if you know anything about New York and Westchester County, it's totally separate from the Bronx. So if you try to get information in Westchester County, you, it will not link to anything in the boroughs. So there was all of these phone calls for hours that I wasn't getting anywhere until I got there. So it was all of this searching and unbelievable and this could not have happened and nah, no way and unbelievable and just in denial kind of. And then having to see him because, like you said, I worked at the jails. I worked volunteering, going and speaking at the prison at Westchester County for about 20 years now. And this is the same jail he actually was at. And I had to go and visit my same son, my son in the same jail where I ministered at. So um, 
going to the hospital where he was because after he uh, took her life, he tried to take his. So he was in the hospital where he had to get his, both his arteries replaced, tried to um, cut both his arteries to kill himself. He drunk Clorox trying to kill himself. He got in a tub with a radio trying to kill himself. And he, he's still here. So it just was very unbelievable. It still is to this day sometimes just talking about it. So my day one was devastating, if I had to use one word. Um, another word, unbelievable. You know, something that you just think would never happen to you. Who would ever thought that this would happen to anybody in their life? Nobody. But when it, the judge gave him the time. Yes. And you're in the courtroom? Yes. And they walk out of the courtroom. What are you thinking? Um, still unbelievable. Um, it was a feeling of, um, one, you go walk in a courtroom and one, the people you think are there to support you wasn't there. That was one, the support, walking in a courtroom and having to face a whole nother family and having certain people you thought would be there and wasn't there. Um, having to look at that other family, no matter how much time he got that I might not have wanted my son to get any time, you still looked at a family who wanted him to be dead. I looked at a family who wanted him to have life and looking at a family who's angry and you're sitting like really side by side. So that feeling of when he got the 17 to life, it had went from 25 and in a matter of three days, 25, 22, 20, and the lowest you can go on um, that murder charge is 15. But they said they weren't coming down to nothing but 17. So um, it was it was devastating to go three, four days in a row and just keep hearing testimony after testimony and then um, get to that that part. It was just an emptiness. It was it was a feeling and you almost can't describe. You just numb. You don't you don't I don't remember like anything that day. You don't remember if you hungry, did you eat, do you want to eat. Everything is just real just unbelievable. So they take him to DOC. Mm-hmm. And you're sitting at home. He called. What's the first phone call like? The first phone call was very hard because the first phone call, he didn't want to live. Um, And then there's another phone call where he wants to reach the dead to apologize to her. Then there's a phone call because you're in a prison where I worked at. So, you know, everybody, everybody knows you. And, um... You know, I can only tell my side. I can never, that's one thing I want to say. I can never tell my son's story. I can never tell. I can only tell it like you're telling, asking me from my point of view as a mother. So um, in this case, just to rewind all the way back, he was and her was smoking K2. They were, that was the first case of K2 in Westchester County that somebody died. She stabbed him. He stabbed her back and he killed her. So... Um, never had any kind of violence or anything, but this is what drugs will do to you. And anybody that research or know anything about K2, you're nowhere in your right bad. mind at all. You will hurt yourself and don't even feel it and just walk around. So um, that happened. It doesn't make it an excuse e- no. either, right? Because he had a choice before he ever used the drug. That's the way I look at it. You always had a choice. You know, you, you did it, but when you did it to me, and I believe totally in God, you didn't belong to God. You didn't belong to yourself. You belonged to the devil. Because at that point, you was listening to spirits and listening to things that was not of God. And that wasn't yours because you wouldn't have a choice to kill somebody that you love or hurt someone that you love. So how do you wrap your mind around? Because I'm trying, because my mom went through this mm. with me and my little brother, not just me. Me and my little brother both got what they call football numbers. Mm. And we go in, I'm 18. He went in a year later, he was 18. Mm-hmm. And we got football numbers. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, yeah, I'm in there. I pick up more numbers. And my mother used to, I, I mean, how does, what do you do when they tell you your son is just gone? Just like, yo, we got him. And you got to sign. I tell people the worst part was my mother had to sign papers to come see me. Mm. Her baby, she had to sign papers and get permission to come see me. Wow. So when you go see him or you talk to him, I mean, um, in the beginning, um, and still sometimes, the phone will ring and I have to like take a deep breath because I don't know if today how you're feeling, right? And you may you may notice today is a day that you're. You don't want to live. Today is a day that you want to live. Today is a day you, like I said before, you want to reach the dead. Today is a day that you want to change your religion. 
I want to change your belief. Today is a day that you miss everybody. Today is a day I have to call. I have to tell you that somebody passed away in our family. Today is a day that I have to tell you there's a new life that came in our family. Somebody had a baby or somebody got married. You have good, you have bad. So it's a roller coaster ride. So um, not me having certain news that I have to tell them, good, bad, or indifferent. And then also me not knowing what to prepare myself for when I say hello not knowing where he's at, you're, you're in a yard, you don't have much time, have you been raped, have you, are you going to tell me the truth, is anybody bullying you, um, are you asking for money on your books because you owe somebody, are, are you fighting, are you in a hole because of, all of these things run through your mind just with a phone ringing and you getting ready to answer, and I don't even know if this is the jail because you saved, the, I have the number saved as his name, so it could be the jail calling me, telling me that he's dead. These are the things that happen on a phone when a phone rings to a mother. How do you feel when your son, when you, when people are talking about their kids and you're standing there? It is it is um, embarrassing. When it comes to church and it comes to the ministry that I have, I'm definitely not ashamed of it. I, I tell it because um, I feel like a lot of times within um, ministry, we don't tell where we're at. We like to tell when we out of jail. We like to tell when we out of a situation. And we don't like to talk about when we're in it. So this is something I can't, one thing I can't control, right? I can't control this situation. I can't come and just say, I'm Stephanie. I got the best lawyer in the world. And I got the most money than anybody. It still would not get him out of jail. You get what I'm saying? So right. uh, there is rooms that you, you are absolutely right that I don't say anything. They say, hey, how, how old are you? And I say, hey, I'm... Um, I'm 53, and my son, they say, how old is your son? My son is 20, um, 33, and they're like, really? Where he at? New York? New York. And I leave it right there. There are conversations, and um, there are times that I leave it there. Um, and there are places and spaces that I speak on it. There are places and spaces that they are young people and there are other people, and I feel like I need to tell it while I'm in it. I need to tell it while I'm hurting. I need to tell it while it's still a trigger. I need to tell it because I think that when you show and people uh, almost like your wound, even though a Band-Aid is there, but when you show people your realness, you get their attention. And I feel like sometimes telling this, it can save somebody else's child not being on that drug. So no. certain spaces... I, I, I was like your mom. Certain situations, I felt like I'd never see this person again. I have a son that's 33 years old. He lives in New York. I know mm -hmm. that your little brother, the world knows him as DMX. What did you call him? Earl. Earl. X. X. <laughs> mm -hmm. Was he from White Plains, too? No. He was from Yonkers. He's okay, from Yonkers. He's from Yonkers. Yes. So, but he went to jail mm -hmm. many a times. Mm -hmm. He went to treatment mm -hmm. many a times. Yes. And literally, the other night I was home, I got HBO to watch this thing, We Are the City, from this Baltimore thing. I didn't like it. But um, while I was on there, I happened to see his last tour. Mm -hmm. So I went on and I clicked it to watch it, you know what I'm saying? And um, of course, you're in it. He's family stuff. But he's on stage in front of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. I never really watched music. I'm not a music person. But I'm like, yo, I know your brother, of course. He on stage and there's thousands of people just mm -hmm. like chanting and Screaming, yeah. white, black, Spanish, from all over the planet. Mm -hmm. and But he would get caught up, mm -hmm. and he couldn't call them thousands of people. Nope. He would call you. Yes. What were those phone calls? <sighs> um, let me go to the last phone calls. Um, about two weeks before he passed, he was here in Atlanta. And um, if anybody followed me on social media... Whenever he came to Atlanta, he would say, we're going to cook, and he would make crab legs. That was his specialty, spaghetti. He loved Kool-Aid, and he said, I'm coming over. We're going to have fun, and he just liked to play pool. He liked to hear music, old-school songs, not even rap or his songs, just old-school songs, and he just loved to um, just have fun and be, be like a family person. Um, the last phone call I got from him, um, he just said pray. And before he left... Uh, my pastor, Pastor Chaz in Morrow, um, Georgia, um, gave me a bottle of oil. And for some reason, I said, I need to get this oil to him before he gets on the plane. It was a Sunday. That was his flight out of here when he left here. And um, I, I made it to him. I said, hey, hurry up. You got to catch your flight. You got to get out of here because your flight's coming up. And that was the last hug, the last time I 
face to face saw him and um the struggle was real you know the struggle really really was real and if you're not in that person's shoes you can say all day i've had people come and say if i was there if i was around this that the struggle was really real and um he used that oil he tried um in the last call it was like just pray i have last text just pray and that's all i could do but when he used to call you from prison Oh yeah, what were those calls? Um, he would be really encouraging. He was in a whole nother space. You know, you don't have access to certain drugs and certain things in jail. So the last time he was in jail, we were we were closer in that. In that, the last time he was in jail for the taxes, because at that point he had called and said, I, "Can you stay at the house with Desiree, which I'm very close to his fiance, in Exodus and help her with the baby?" So I stayed at his house for that one year. He did that bid and um, for Fed time for the tax evasion. And um, we would go up to the jail at least once a month, take the baby. I would drive them up. So he was very encouraging. He was coming up with other music. He was always giving us, you know, it didn't even sound like how I was telling you things with my son. Maybe, you know, it's a different case, right? He's in there for, you know, tax. And um, he didn't get nothing special, you know. It wasn't like that. They actually told me when I went up to that jail that I couldn't wear the Rough Rider um, are no more up there. I couldn't wear any DMX logos and stuff when I went up to see him. But basically when they, they treated him like any other inmate and when he called, he was really encouraging us. You know, do take care of this business. Do this. Make sure y'all doing that. Make sure you're doing this. And he was really encouraging us. He was in that headspace that he was telling us. My mom has told me this, and I've heard it from many of moms. Mm -hmm. When I got locked up, she hated it. Oh, yeah. But she said I can sleep at night. Did you ever say that when he was inside? Yes. Yes, for two reasons. One, there was a sense of safety, right? The jails is not really what they I mean. sense of it. But two, you knew where they were. And um, like my son right now, there's going to be a call just about every day. It's just what kind of call is it? Where's his headspace? Where's that person's headspace? But there's a sense of, I know where you're at. You know, I'm praying that you'll be safe. But I, I know where you're at. And there's, there's a different feeling than being on the streets than it is being in jail. And you can't get certain things. You know, they get cell phones. They do get certain drugs. But they're, you, the, the habits and the things like Earl had, you, you couldn't have those kind of habits in jail. So, your son. Mm hmm State of New York. Yes. He has one of these. Oh, yeah. In case yes. you never saw one. I never saw it. That's I exactly what tablet. he has. This is the tablet. That is the tablet. Okay. That is officially the tablet. Let me tell you the part two. He's watching you on that tablet right now. What's up, my quad? <laughs> no, I did not know that. <laughs> nah, he's, well, this is playing in DOC New York. Right now? Not right this second, but he's going to be watching you live That's on DOC up. New York. That's what's up. So, That's what's up. You didn't tell me that part? What you thought was... Listen, I don't know. Whatever you ask me to do is going to be done. Right. That's that's the respect I have for you for the work that you're doing and you know, making, you know, allowing us to deal with our triggers, right? Some of the things that you're saying I probably would never even say again. So I might need a little, you know, therapy after this. Yeah, yeah I do that. Pulling up things that, you know, lay dormant and then there's certain triggers, right? So there's certain things that people don't ask the question, we don't say nothing. You right. know what I'm saying? But yeah, what's so, up? So we couldn't or you couldn't talk to X on that. Nope. But you can definitely talk to your son. Yes. What do you want to tell him? Wow. So, my Quan, what I would say to you is, I don't believe that you're going to be in jail the rest of your life. I believe that there's a reason that God spared your life. And I believe when you find that reason... And us trying to get that life off the end, whatever it's going to take that for that to happen, I believe in God's time you will be released. Not my time, not your time. But I truly believe when you're in the right headspace and ready for this world the way it is now, I believe that God will release you. Whether it's 17, whether it's 18, but I do believe it won't be life. And one thing you'll never, ever have to worry about is my death. I, God promised me that this is one death you will never have to deal with in jail. 
moms. So I'm not going nowhere till you come out. There's a lot of other guys in there mm-hmm. who got moms. Yep. And their moms don't have the opportunity mm-hmm. to come on here mm-hmm. and speak to them. Mm-hmm. So I need you to go back on there. Okay. You need to be mom for the 500,000 people who are right here. I'm going to say this. God is not going to put no more on any of us that we can bear. What happens is we don't know how much we can bear. None of us volunteers for certain things that happen in our life. But I truly believe that you built for whatever you went through because nothing just happens in the life of a believer. And no matter what religion you are, no matter what God you believe in, nothing just happens to any of us. So even the good, bad, or the indifferent. Let me give you a scenario. There is the first psalm. It says to be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. There are things that happen to all of us underground. There are things that make roots that happens to a tree. A tree does not grow on concrete. There's no way you're going to grow unless you have some dirt on you. So I don't care how perfect or however we think we are, in order for us to grow and be like that tree, we got to have some dirt. So some situations have happened to all of us. But for whatever reason, we're still here. So sometimes you have to ask yourself, God allowed me to still be here, whether you in jail or whether you out here. God, you allowed me to be here. What is my reason? What, what happens is now this tree now has leaves. This tree now has branches that's growing. It has different seasons. Certain things happen to you and you fall off, but believe it's going to grow back. But one thing about it, when we deal with the things that's underground, we're able to grow. In order for the tree to grow, it had to have roots. All of us got roots. All of us come from somewhere. All of us have some underground issues that some of us ain't going to tell nobody. You was raped, molested, certain things happened to you. You ain't going to tell nobody. That's that underground, but it still made you a tree. But a tree doesn't get up and unroot itself, and that's what happened. When the storm came, what did we do? When the storm came, where did we go? Trees don't just get up. You had to be uprooted by a storm. So when storms come, you got to be able to say, the leaves is going to go because winter's not here no more, but summer's here, and this is my season. And you got to know that you in your season because some of y'all, some of y'all in there are doing better than us. What? Some of y'all in there doing better than us because y'all have a a better mind. Your thought pattern is different than us. So you're more free in there than we are here because some of us is locked up in our minds and we got our freedom out here. But you're in there and you're not even locked up. So if you're in your right mind, that's a blessing. If you can wake up every day and you know your name, who you are, what's your number in your cell, that's a blessing because you know where you at. I asked God and I said, God, I don't never want to be here if I don't know who I am. Dementia at all. I don't want to be here if I don't know who I am and who you are. If you know who you are, if you're able to pick up a phone, if you got the activities of your limbs, if you're able to do so, if you're able just to speak, that's a blessing right there. So if nothing else Just say to yourself, I want to be a tree that's planted. No matter what happens to me, no matter how much time I get, no matter if my mama don't take my call, my sister, my baby mama, my kids never come see me, I'm going to still be like a tree that's planted. Because guess what? A tree don't grow with all of the other stuff on the side of it. Don't grow with another tree coming out of it. A tree is alone. And sometimes some of the things we go through is alone. But no, it's only a season. New branches going to come. New leaves is going to come. And you're still going to grow. But deal with the underground. Deal with them roots. Deal with them things. Start dealing with the things that's underground that happened to us. And I say us because we all got some underground issues that made us who we are, good, bad, or indifferent. But more than anything, hold your head up. Message for moms. Messages for moms. This is a message from mom. Now, they got to call their moms later because we stay calling mom. Mm -hmm. Mom always take the call. She always... This, so, listen, stop having your mother do your criminal activity. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I didn't say, yo, call mom, make this play. I used to do that. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize I was making my mother my co-defendant. Mm-hmm. I called home because that's the only one I could trust. Yep. So many people ran off with so much money mm-hmm. that I knew moms wouldn't run off. Right. So I had my mother making calls she shouldn't have made. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Just because I didn't know no better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know better. I messed up. Please leave your mother out your stuff. You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> if your girl run off with your money... Get a different girl. <laughs> Don't make your mother your co-defendant. It's just a, she won't say no, most likely, but you should say no and not include her in any of the penitentiary politics. You know what I'm saying handle your business as a grown-up. Leave her out of it. You know what I'm saying. Before we go, yes. I'd be remiss. We gave a shout out to your son, sub nephew. You know what I'm saying? And the men. 
But you know there's women in jail. Oh, yeah. There are tons and tons of women in jail. And this is going to play. I shout out to my girls in Arizona. You know what I'm saying? Televerde is in the building. You know what I'm saying? Keep doing the work. I appreciate you. You know what I'm saying? I go to the women's prisons, too. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them dealing with depression. I started going out, talking to the young man about being whole again. You can refix mm-hmm. your life. You get over mm-hmm. the crime that you did. Mm-hmm. Then they asked him to go to the juvenile center. These girls are dealing with rape, molestation, drug abuse, domestic violence, shame, body shaming. And they're telling the girls, you can't be whole again. You used to be a prostitute. You can't bounce back from that. You used to be an addict. You can't bounce. No one wants to marry no crackhead chick. But I can be a crackhead and bounce back. I can be a stick-up kid and bounce back. I can be despicable and bounce back. But mm-hmm. the women aren't giving that same message that they can be whole again. Oh yes. So I started talking to young girls when I first came home in the detention saying, you can bounce back, too. Oh, yeah. It's not just for us. Nope. It's for everybody. That's Redemption right. is for everybody. That's right. So I need you to give a message specific mm-hmm. for the women. So for the women, the women that's incarcerated, right? For the women, there's hope. Um, you always hear me go back to the Bible. There was a woman that was in the Bible with the issue of blood for over 12 years. <laughs> she went to everybody she could. And if if it was up to everybody, there was nothing else that could be done. But then she went and touched the hem of the garment, and she was made whole. One thing you said, whole. So there is a way that you can be made whole, even in your situation, because then it goes right back to the mind. Where are you at in your mind? So you can go back and you can be whole. There's another woman in the Bible. Came, Jesus was writing in the dirt. He was like, what's up? She was like, all these men around here, the man that you with ain't even yours. So, yeah, the Bible deals with everything. So, yeah, she was what we would call a little hoe. He said, the man you with ain't even yours. But he looked around at everybody and said, whoever, if y'all don't have sin, cast the first stone. Go ahead, stone her. If y'all don't have, y'all perfect. You might not be sleeping around, but you not perfect. So if I would say anything to the women, you can be whole. Be whole right where you at. And I think we concentrate a lot on just getting out of jail. When we get out of our mind of being in a certain place and putting goals and things together, because some people not getting out. The jail you took me to, there's some people that told me they got life, they not coming out. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because we so used to going in the prison I was going to, they, 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 they were getting out. I didn't experience that till I went with you that the man said to me, I'll, ne- I'll never come out. He said, I got life. I already know I'm not coming out. He was content. He set up things with his family. He's talking to them about how running a business. He was doing certain things, and I never saw that. So he showed me that no matter where you at, because I said it before, we can be out here and worse than some of y'all that's in jail. Because you're free in your mind and you're dealing and you accepted the situation and one, you forgave yourself. So no matter what you've done, no matter what you said, no matter who you've been with, no matter what happened to you, you still here. And until we face the fact that why am I still here? Why does God got me still here? And you get to the point of that and start to focus on just you. I know you might have kids. I know you got a mama. I know you got a sister. I know you got a brother. I know you got a baby daddy, baby mama, all of that. But when you deal with you, there's something I spoke about at a seminar, the deadly disease of me, myself, and I. And most of us have that disease because we don't want to deal with the issues that I talked about underground. We don't want to deal with the issues of forgiveness ourselves, not other people. I'm just talking about me, myself, and I. Once you start dealing with that, it's a process. It says in the Bible, forgetting those things that's behind and then pressing towards the future, towards the mark. Remember, forgetting with the ING lets you know it don't just happen overnight. It's a process. Allow yourself to go through the process. Allow ourselves to go through therapy. Allow us yourselves to talk your things through. If you can't talk, write it out. Whatever you got to do to deal with you. And when you start dealing with you, you'll be able to be like that woman who was healed. Because her issue was blood that she had, an issue of blood. But her issue 
may not be the issue you got, but she had it for over 10 long years. So at the end of the day, no matter how long you had it, no matter who you went to, no matter what you had to deal with, you still can be made whole. She was made whole in the instant. We've been doing book club. Mm -hmm. And our book for today is going to be for my guy, this gentleman, Doug Conant. Mm -hmm. He runs an association called CECP. He's the chairman. If you don't know what CECP is, for those who are inside and have your family look it up, you can look it up. It stands for Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose. I met this gentleman probably a year ago, mm -hmm. and he put me on to come speak to him. I just went to New York and spoke to him. It's 230 companies that control $21 trillion. And they gave away $41 billion to social good last year. And they brought me in to help them figure out how to do it better. Wow. So not only can we come home right. as sons, right. but we can thrive on a whole nother level that nobody thought possible. Yeah. I stood in the room with the leaders from Walmart, from Apple, from AIG, from Delta, mm -hmm. from Walgreens, I'm saying, from Chase Bank, from Wells Fargo, all of them. And they're looking at me for advice and for guidance. Mm. So it's not just we can just come home and get a, a job. Yeah, we can right. come home and have the big $21 trillion in one room. And they're saying, Andre, how do we do this? Right. That's what's my mom was like, yeah, you always had it in you. Mm -hmm. You always had it in you. I just didn't believe. Right. When he gets to belief, it's next level. That's right. My mom's favorite saying, boy, if you can take 10% of your energy and turn it to something positive, you turn this world upside down. That's what's up. I got past 10%. <laughs> That's what's and the up. world's definitely on tilt. <laughs> so, see. ladies and gentlemen, yes, I even dressed up for you today. This I is a mom see. edition. <laughs> I ain't got the hoodie on. I ain't got the T-shirt on. You know what I'm saying? What I came with the, Listen, I dressed up, up just for you. Oh, you know what I'm saying? I wanted up. to be respectful. Everybody else is getting the hoodie and the T-shirt. That's what's up. <laughs> Well, I think but for the mom edition, I'm saying of day one, mm -hmm. had to come correct. So on behalf of all sons and all daughters, we salute you and those that you represent. Day one is coming to you live. We in real time. Shout out to New York State yes. because White Plains is in the house. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, until the next time, you hold it down. Be good and know that we love you. We're caring for you. If you want us, we already pulled up to the penitentiary. She's been doing prison yeah. work for over 20 years. I'm ready. Let's do it. I've been doing it for like the last 22 years. So if you want us, holler at your warden, holler at your superintendent, holler at the director of programs, and we'll come through. Yes. And we'll talk to you and build you in real time. But my only question is, do you really want change? Or you just want entertainment? Mm -hmm.